Well, thanks again. It's always a pleasure to come back to Channel Islands National Park. I live here in Ventura and I uh, play out at the islands and I used to work here at Channel Islands National Park in the Interpretation Division, leading tours at Anacapa Island, working in the Visitor Center uh, before I went to the Fish and Wildlife Service where I spent most of the time, uh, as John mentioned, uh, in government service. And now, I've worked, now I work for the Minerals Management Service and uh, how many people have heard of the Minerals Management Service? There's a few people shaking their heads and the other people are still shaking their heads. What's going on? <laughs> Uh, Minerals Management Service is a Department of Interior agency, sister agency to the National Park Service. It's a very small agency and we work with offshore oil and gas development. All those platforms that you see out there are managed through our agency. Uh, and also we're working now with alternative energy proposals offshore. So it's actually a new and interesting era for that. But I'm the marine mammal biologist uh, with, that, with the program there and it's, uh, it's a whole new, um, new look. But I'm here to talk about sea otters, which is really my favorite subject. And uh, for those of you, I, I know there's several folks that I recognize in the audience, and there's several that I don't. Uh, for those of you who've seen one of my presentations, I've revamped this just a little bit. And I'm going to focus a lot on the history of sea otters, because a lot of people don't realize what role sea otters played in the history uh, of the North Pacific, as well as right here in California, in our neck of the woods in Santa Barbara and Ventura area. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on with range expansion of sea otters. How many of you have seen sea otters before in real life, not just a picture? A lot of you. How many have you seen them here in Ventura? There's a few of you. How many have seen one in Ventura or Santa Barbara 10 years ago? Oh, Well, you might have seen one 10 years ago, but it would have been really hard to see. Uh, and so uh, things are changing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit and give you an update of what is changing with the Seattle population and some of the uh, politics surrounding that. And then lastly, I'll just talk about what to look for when you're looking for sea otters. So if you're out there and you want to see one and you're looking in the right places, how to find one. And if you happen to find one dead, what it looks like too, because we have a lot of mistaken identification on those. So we'll go through all that in a short time, in about a half hour. And um, uh, I'll ask you to hold questions till the end. Um, because generally with a talk like this, I have a lot of questions, a lot of very good questions that a lot of people generally want to hear answers to. Uh, so I'll just go through the information I have as an introduction, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so talking about the sea otter's return to Southern California. These days we're taking a global look at everything. So I wanted to give you a global perspective and look at the North Pacific which is where we're going to start our story about sea otters. And we're going to get in just a little bit closer here and see where sea otters were historically. Sea otters ranged from the northern islands to Japan all the way through, I will try and use this pointer, all the way through the Aleutian Islands, uh, what's now Alaska, uh, Canada, Oregon, Washington, and all the way into Mexico. A few people realized that our populations did go all the way about halfway down the Baja Peninsula. There were actually fairly large numbers of animals down there at one time. Shortly after they discovered by Europeans, populations were wiped out. They were essentially extirpated from all this section of coast here. They are thought to be extinct in California. They became extinct in Mexico. Much smaller colonies as represented by the smaller otters. So why did they disappear? I think most people know this part of the story. Why did they disappear? Fur hunting, exactly. And I'm going to start the fur hunting discussion right on a little island here, which is not labeled, but certainly has a name, Bering Island. And at Bering Island, Vitus Bering, who was an explorer of the North Pacific and, and uh, looked, in, looked at lands along what's now Alaska, shipwrecked in the 1700s on Bering Island. And he died, actually, on the island, so it bears his name, no pun intended. And so uh, he died, and about half his crew died. The remaining crew that survived, survived in part by eating sea otters, as well as other things, whatever you could find. Uh, and they brought these pelts back uh, to the European continent, which, which sparked, and it's been attributed to sparking the entire fur trade throughout the North Pacific in the 1700s. Now, I had the privilege of going to Bering Island this summer. I went there for five weeks for a sea otter research expedition, a joint expedition with the Russians, uh, where we're comparing sea otter populations in Russia with uh, what's going on in Alaska and California. 
And uh, I was amazed to find that there's still uh, quite a few historic structures uh, there. It's actually a very small community. And Russia is a whole other story, which is a whole other talk. And I'd love to talk about it sometime after I recover from the trip. Um, this, this particular uh, house, uh, as you can see, um, this translation is a little rough. Uh, but um, it, uh, obviously from the 1870s. And this is actually, for those of you that are history buffs, this is not Gutchinson and Cool. It's actually Hutchinson and Cole and Company. But notice, San Francisco. The Russian-American Fur Company was active in Bering Island at that time. In the 1870s, 1870s, virtually all the otters were gone from that area by the time these fur uh, facilities were built. At the time, they were har focusing on harvest of fur seals and foxes on the island. These are sea otter skulls, which I seem to find nailed to the buildings in several places. They're probably not from that historic period. Um, but for some reason, they were attractive to nail to the wall, so they're there. But there's far more to the hunts than just Russian, uh, uh, Russian hunting. Other people got involved. This is a portrait of James Cook. Most of you recognize James Cook as being the great Pacific explorer who had met his demise in Hawaii, on the island of Hawaii. But he traded for sea otter pelts in the Pacific Northwest, specifically around Vancouver Island, took them through Hawaii, to China for trade. The uh, English and later Americans, this particular gentleman is named uh, William Goodwin Dana. He is a prominent citizen in Santa Barbara in the 1830s. Uh, and he had ships uh, that were out hunting sea otters here in California off our coast. Both the Americans and the English could trade with China through ports that weren't accessible to the Russian traders. And so there's these alliances formed between Russians and Americans uh, and there were a few other nationalities involved. But we think of California as being settled during 1849 at the time of the gold rush. And certainly there was a huge influx of people and it changed the whole backdrop of California. But prior to that, what brought people to the North Pacific were the sea otters. They were easy to trade. Um, they were transportable, portable, and they were high value. At this time, um, and I'll just, uh, they were a little bit, uh, in the 1850s, a pelt was going for, I've got the numbers here, let me get them out so I don't uh, misstate them. Uh, in 1845, actually, there's a record of some pelts uh, being sold that were from California for $56 a pelt. Now, at that time, that was a lot of money. And I actually did the conversion um, into today's dollars, and that would be roughly around $1,500 per pelt. Now, that's a lot of money, but you think, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, can you make a living off of it? Well, I also found out this same gentleman that was involved with these trades, um, he uh, had bought a three-bedroom adobe home uh, in what's now Old Town San Diego, and it cost $96 for a home. <laughs> Two sea otters could buy you a house. Uh, property values have changed a little bit at this point in time. But because of this high value, there was a, a tremendous pressure. And even a few otters was worth a lot of money. So let's go now to some place closer to our time. A little bit later, the hunt came down to the California coast. And one of the characters uh, in the history of this hunt was Captain George Nidever. And uh, I believe they might still have it in the visitor center, but there's a book called The uh, Life and Adventures or Life and Misadventures of George Nidever. Um, he was a frontiersman, came across the uh, Sierras into California, hunting beaver and ot river otter, uh, and ended up hunting sea otters in California. Uh, and as I was doing research for this presentation, another little tidbit came up. Uh, there was a gentleman named Alan Light. Alan Light was an African man he was a free slave that came to California in the 1820s aboard a ship called the Pilgrim. The Pilgrim is the same ship that was made famous by a gentleman by the name of Richard Henry Dana. Dana Point. Richard Henry Dana, the book Two Years Before the Mast. If you haven't read it, it's a great book. It talks about California before <coughs> the gold rush. Anyway, George and Endeavor got together with Alan Light. Um, for some reason, and the, there's interesting accounts, he, uh, he and his comrades, uh, or, or his compatriots, or whichever we called them at that point in time, 
didn't think Alan Light was appropriate name for a black man, so they named him Black Steward. <laughs> um, and uh, he traveled with them, but uh, Alan Light then later became a naturalized Mexican citizen and was given a commission by the Mexican government to, as, to oversee otter hunting in California. And again, things, a different time period, different thing, times. George Nidever hunted sea otters, and I've got Island Blue Dolphins. You've seen this on here. Do you know what the connection between George Nidever and Island Blue Dolphins is? Yes. Yeah, what was it? Well, uh, I put you on the spot. Nine, nine <laughs> the the uh, Juana Maria off of San Nicolas. Exactly right. Nidever was, uh, had ships hunting for sea otters here in the Santa Barbara area. Um, and as you know, the story, uh, for those of you who read the story, and many of you are probably very familiar with the story, it's a fictional account, and it's very fictional, of, a, of a, actually a very real person, a woman that lived on San Nicolas Island. And in the story, and most accounts seem to verify this, the reason that she was left on the island is that the missionary, missionaries, missionary folks were taking people off the island because of interactions with Aleuts, Aleut people that were brought down to hunt sea otters illegally off the coast. There's an account of an American ship getting together with the Russian company, bringing down Aleuts, dropping off um, in, uh, Aleuts onto the islands to hunt sea otters uh, in what was then Mexico, Cal Mexican California, and then coming to the coast to trade while the Aleuts were hunting offshore. It was very difficult to, to patrol, and even today it's difficult to patrol out at the islands sometimes, but at that time it was virtually impossible, so these Aleuts could do whatever they wanted. Juan and Maria, the people that were living on there were removed from the island. She was left. There's different accounts of why she was left. But there's no, def no, no question. She was left there. And George Nidever was out on uh, otter hunting when he came across her and brought her back to the coast. So otters played a role in much of our local history here. Now I'm going to go a little bit more forward in history. We talked about 1700s otters were discovered, a hunt began, and virtually in within 100 years most of those otters were gone. And these colonies were left, and they re recovered um, somewhat here in Alaska and in uh, California. And I'm going to talk about the 1960s in, in Alaska, and particularly this section over here in a little island called Amchika Island. Um, some of you may have seen my presentation before, but there's something that was going on in that part of the Pacific that actually had a profound effect on sea otters. Does anyone know what that was? 1968 through about 1972. No? No? Okay, well, um, I'll give you a hint. Russia's right over here. You can see it from Anchorage on a clear day. <laughs> okay. Well, what does it have to do with sea otters? Well, I'm going to show you. Okay. This is an atomic weapon, or actually this is an atomic warhead that was lowered into the ground the, the largest below-ground nuclear test ever conducted in the United States and perhaps the world was conducted on Amchika Island. There were three nuclear tests done there. Um, it was far away from our home. It was very secret. Um, although people got, became aware of it, including the Fish and Wildlife Service, who actually had a refuge on that island. And, uh, and uh, they brought up the concerns that they had for nuclear testing would have on the wildlife on the island. Um, nevertheless, the tests went forward, and the Fish and Wildlife Service was given about $50,000 and said, well, you can move some of these otters away if you want. But we're still doing the test. There's actually three nuclear tests done there. As I mentioned, it's the largest below-ground nuclear test. Um, it was more than 300 times the power of the Hiroshima bomb. Um, incredible, incredible. And most people don't know about it. Um, and actually, it spawned a, a well-known environmental group a little bit more of an aggressive environmental group. Do you know which group it was? Greenpeace. Greenpeace. It spawned Greenpeace. So, so why did it play a pivotal role other than being in the way, the otters being in the way of the tests? Well, as a result of uh, the money that was given, some animals were translocated from the Aleutian Islands to other parts of the coast. 
and successfully translocated so that new colonies were formed in southeast Alaska, Washington, uh, Washington and Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, there was a translocation to Oregon, but those otters didn't, um, didn't hold stick. Okay, so there's translocation. So now we're filling out the population a little bit. But what about our otters here in California? That's what we're really interested in, right? Well, in California, they were thought to be extinct for the most part until they were, quote, rediscovered um, when the Bixby Creek Bridge was built. On, uh, they created the uh, access to the Big Sur Coast. Uh, when that road was built in the 30s, uh, people now could travel that area. Now, otters were there, obviously, before, at least in small numbers. And, and now people could see them, and they were, oh my gosh, we have sea otters. Now, I failed to mention that sea otters were protected by an international treaty in 1911. So hunting stopped in 1911. All legal hunting stopped. There's still some subsistence hunting allowed in Alaska in, in uh, small amounts. Uh, but the hunting stopped in, in uh, 1911. In California, otters were rediscovered in the 30s. They were listed as a threatened species in 1977, just a few years after the Endangered Species Act was, Act was passed in 1973. And at that time, I was actually uh, led to believe, and I actually gave presentations where there was probably about 50 otters at that time in California. But I re-looked re at the data and the accounts, and there was probably about 150 otters at the time uh, in, in, in the 30s. Uh, but there may have been as few as 50 by the time the turn of the century when the hunting stopped. What happened when otters weren't here for a long time? Um, I want to digress a bit in the effects of otters on the environment. Otters eat things like abalone, crabs, lobsters, clams. Um, they're known for a voracious appetite. They're the smallest of the marine mammals. They rely on their fur pelt to keep warm not a large layer of blubber like most other marine mammals. As a result, they have a high metabolism, they have to eat a lot, and they have a profound effect on invertebrate populations, things like I mentioned, abalone and lobsters and crabs and so on. And we've become used to that. And these are pictures of friends of mine, actually it's the same guy, uh, taking abalone and lobster and, and, and uh, now when sea otters return to the area, um, they are now occupying and taking some of those same resources that we've taken for granted as being available for us to use, both commercially and recreationally. Uh, so the sea otter population has grown in California, and with it has grown a controversy over, well, wait a minute, otters are changing the fisheries. Um, is that right? They, we were here before the otters, right? The, this dilemma came to a peak uh, back in 1986 uh, when the Fish and Wildlife Service was looking at recovery actions. And remember that we had these translocations from other parts of the, uh, uh, the Pacific, and they were successful in creating new populations. So at the time, Fish and Wildlife Service said, well, let's get more otters in more places. This will help to minimize risk of something like a large oil spill from affecting the entire population. And the thought of translocating otters was, was brought forward, but it wasn't without this controversy. Where could otters be? And this controversy went all the way to the Congress of the United States and ended up in a public law signed by then President Reagan. Now, I don't know of any other program of this nature that was authorized by an act of Congress and signed by the, and, and authorized by the President. Um, and in this, it just allowed the Fish and Wildlife Service to translocate otters. And if they did, it placed certain conditions on the program. It said that, first of all, we had to have a management zone for sea otters, um, meaning that in balancing the needs of otters against the needs of people, let's let otters have this area and people have this area. So Fish and Wildlife Service was tasked with designating these areas in consultation with the state of California. The state of California at the time was very much in support of zonally managing sea otters because they managed the fisheries and they saw the pending conflict. So a management zone was formed. And a line was drawn at Point Conception, from Point Conception to the Mexican border, all the Channel Islands, which are within the park and the marine sanctuary, were included to be otter-free zone. No otters allowed. Otters would be allowed to be translocated to San Nicolas Island. San Nicolas Island is about 60 miles offshore. It's managed by the US Navy. Historically, a lot of sea otters there. It was chosen in part because it was thought easier to contain sea otters because sea otters would not swim across 60 miles of water to get home. They wouldn't know how. 
they wouldn't physically make it, they would starve to death. Um, we were proven wrong on all accounts. <laughs> Um, the, uh, let's see, what do I have on this map? Yeah, let me just go back here a little bit. We took a hundred, and I'm saying we, this is the otter community, and I work for Fish and Wildlife Service. I still work for the Department of Interior, so I can say it's we. Uh, and we'll take responsibility, or I'll, I'll say that this Department of Interior is taking responsibility. We moved otters uh, from the central coast of California, uh, small groups, to San Nicolas Island. Over a three-year period, we took 140 sea otters to San Nicolas Island. Within three years, we had 13 animals at San Nicolas Island. What happened to all the animals? They essentially swam away. We did underestimate the homing ability of sea otters. And in fact, uh, at one point I was uh, doing an interview for a, a newspaper and talking about this, and I talked. It's always dangerous to talk to a reporter for a long period of time because they're looking for that great sound bite. And I gave it to him. He sa I said, well, it was kind of like Lassie. They wanted to get home. And then the next day, it became Greg Sanders, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, said it's Lassie syndrome. <laughs> so uh, essentially, the otters didn't stay where he put them. And we actually learned a lot more. And I've got a little uh, graphic. This is another book that used to be in the bookstore. I don't think it's out of print right now. Uh, but a children's book describing the adventures of one very real otter, just like in one of the uh, Island of Blue Dolphins. And this otter uh, had been a pup uh, that had come ashore, had been separated from its mom, and rehabilitated at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It was taken to San Nicolas Island. It was, one of the only, it was the only animal that was a rehabilitated animal that was taken to San Nicolas Island in hopes that it would have a better opportunity for survival there. Lots of food, not many otters, and so on. I was there at the island when we released it. He swam away from the island immediately. <laughs> he was presumed dead. Two and a half years later, we found him uh, frolicking with harbor seals at Anacapa Island. Uh, so he went from San Nicolas over to Anacapa. We, actually, we don't know exactly. He didn't make a direct route. But he hung around Anacapa Island for a while in, the, in 1990. Um, and uh, he was in the no otter zone. And so I was one of the people out there capturing otters, and we had to capture him. And it took me quite a bit of time to capture him. And in the meantime, he led us on a merry chase. And uh, we found he really liked harbor seals. He uh, hauled out with harbor seals. He attempted to copulate with harbor seals. Um, he was a young male growing to sexual maturity in an area where there's no otters, and I guess it was the next best thing. <laughs> Funny, the harbor, I, I know, there's not too many young kids in the audience. Um, uh, actually, he, um, he, uh, he, the harbor seals didn't seem to mind, and uh, so... <laughs> But here's in the water zone. We captured him. We moved him up to Moss Landing, released him. He hung around there a little bit, and he swam back down. He didn't come back to Anacap. He went to Catalina. <laughs> and those of you familiar with Catalina Island, there's a quarry near Avalon. He hung out. There's a harbor seal haul-out area there, and he was with the harbor <laughs> seals there. He was captured, moved back. We spun him around three times before we released him. <laughs> he came back down the coast. Went back to Catalina Island, same kelp bed, but he didn't stay there. We didn't have an opportunity to catch him. He went over to San Clemente Island to another harbor seal haul out. He's making the rounds. And then uh, he disappeared off the radar, but we got reports from an otter hanging out with harbor seals in Coronado Islands in Mexico. He was across the border. He was free. The program didn't go as planned. Uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Service was tasked with reevaluating the program. I was involved, I was involved with that reevaluation. And, and actually, since I left three years ago, they're still struggling at Fish and Wildlife Service with the final decision on what to do with the program. Uh, the recommendation was to abandon zonal management of sea otters and leave the otters that are at San Nicolas there. There are actually now about uh, 40 animals that live at San Nicolas Island, the offspring of those small group that did stay. So there is reproduction, it is growing, but it's not serving what the original purpose was, which was to be a reservoir for the rest of the population. You know, you could repopulate if something happened to the rest of the population. Well, 40 animals isn't really going to do it. And given our experience with moving them around, they may not likely stay where we put them. They just don't recognize these lines in the water. <laughs> 
it's a good lesson. We, we see it over and over again in wildlife management too, where otters are taken, or excuse me, animals are taken, and, and okay, we don't want it in our backyard because that's so good, so we'll just put it out in the hills where it belongs, and uh, it might get eaten by a mountain lion, or it might come back, or, or so on. Um, so we have a lot to learn about wildlife. They have a lot to teach us, and so on. But that program continues to be uh, somewhat in limbo at this, at this point in time. Um, initially, the Fish and Wildlife Service was supposed to remove animals. It was declared a failure from San Nicolas Island. Now here, I, I see a, huh? Why would you do that? Well, because there's a lot, quite a deal of pressure that you want to just make a mess and leave them and, and, and go home. So I usually talk a lot more about the translocation program. I've had a whole talk in and of itself, but I wanted to focus on history early on and just touch on the translocation program. It's an important part of our history of this area. Um, our, the history continues as people are continuing to be interested in sea otters and in, in politicians. We already talked about presidents and international folks being interested in sea otters. Um, but uh, Defenders of Wildlife put a plug in for them. They've been very active in promoting what they call Sea Otter Awareness Week. It's now been recognized officially in the state of California. There's a proclamation in the Senate uh, offered by uh, Senator Boxer to recognize the last week in September as Sea Otter Awareness Week. You also have the opportunity now uh, when you pay your taxes. If you notice on the state tax forms, there's a checkbox for sea otters. You probably gloss over those when you do your tax return. Uh, but stuck in there with Alzheimer's and other, other things are sea otters. Uh, and it's been on the uh, tax form for the last two years, and they've generated about a half million dollars of people donating tax, uh, you know, post-tax money to uh, to that cause, and so you have the opportunity there too. So why are people continuing to be interested in otters other than the fact that they're cute and cuddly teddy bears of the sea? Um, well, here in California, the sea otter population is growing and expanding. I'll talk about where it's going here in California in a minute. Uh, but this just is a, a graphic representation of the population starting in 1984 of uh, roughly about 1,300 otters, and we have roughly around 2,700 otters right now in California based on our spring counts. It's been growing, and there's periods of decline or stabilization and then growing. Um, so that's a good sign, but it's not growing very fast. In other populations that are, re that are recovering, like in Washington, we see more than twice the growth rate that we have here in California. And a lot of people are scratching their heads, and why is that the case? Well, there's a number of threats to sea otters. Um, and uh, this was where it gets a little, even a little more interesting, and another few talks in and of themselves if we had time. Uh, but traditionally, the historic threats have been considered to be oil spills. Otters and oil don't mix, although some of my folks at MMS says, don't say that. Well, they don't. But the, the fact is, is that otters are particularly uh, sensitive to oil spills, and that's tankering traffic or offshore oil drilling and so on. Um, and so a lot of the recovery effort in this translocation plan, for example, were centered around the risk of oil spill. And then also we had concern about interactions with fisheries. This is an otter caught in a monofilament gill net. And uh, again, another easy source to see there's mortality. Let's go ahead and address that. And it has been addressed in California. We have moved uh, gill net fisheries out of certain areas and reduced not only the impact on sea otters, but to other species, marine mammals and birds. But a more insidious threat and something that's actually more keenly interesting, interesting to the recovery community for sea otters right now is the threat of disease and premature deaths in population. These animals are dying. Um, unfortunately, this is a dead animal, of course. Um, but they're dying in their prime years. Now, in any population, we expect old animals to die. Unfortunately, we're all going to go sometime. And so there's, you, know, you get that part of the population does die. Very young animals, you know, about 50% of the pups don't make it. That's kind of normal. But it's unusual to see high mortality in animals that are in their reproductive prime years. If you lose a female that's three or four years old, you've lost the reproductive potential for that next um, probably eight to 10 years for that animal. Sea otters live roughly 10 to 15 years in the wild. So we're seeing, focusing the effort on what's killing the prime aged animals. And we have here a picture of a drain. And uh, you know we're here in the Shore to Sea lecture series. This is actually a true Shore to Sea connection. What's happening on shore is affecting our near shore environment. No surprise there. But there are surprising things as far as what we're seeing there. 
One of the things are parasites, um, and what's gotten a lot of press in recent years is a parasite called Toxoplasma, which is found in cats, in domestic cats. The, the cysts are shed from the cats through their feces, and you have to actually have contact with those cysts to get exposed to Toxoplasma. Now, for humans, if you're, if you're pregnant, you're advised not to change your cat litter box, because if you become uh, infected or, or uh, exposed to Toxoplasma during pregnancy, it can cause stillbirths. Um, otherwise, it's fairly benign in many animals and, and, and people that are exposed to it. But for sea otters, it does cause uh, death. And, but wait a minute. I just said they came from cats. We don't have cats rubbing up against sea otters and particularly putting their butt rear ends in front of sea otters. So what's going on? <laughs> well, those feces get washed into the ocean. Okay. Well, the ocean's a great diluter, right? It's all dilution. Dilution is the solution to pollution, including pathogen pollution. But sea otters are getting exposed in high enough rates, and what's su suspected is these cysts, which can survive in the marine environment for actually fairly long periods of time, are getting reconcentrating by filter feeding invertebrates that these otters eat. Isn't that interesting? And how, what does that mean for us? And think about the next time you eat an oyster. Um, so there's, they're telling us a lot about the nearshore environment. They're very key indicators of the nearshore environment. Okay, well, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about the range expansion. This is my last graph, I, I, I promise. Uh, but this shows just general distribution. And I want to point out right here, southeast of Point Conception, which is Southern California, over the last three years, we're seeing these uh, approaching or a little over 100 animals showing up in the springtime. This is really a seasonal movement at this point in time. Uh, in the Seattle population in California during the spring, uh, winter and spring, we normally see male otters traveling to the edges of the range. They kind of take a spring break together, um, leaving females raising pups in the center of the range. There's advantage for the females since they don't have to compete with males for food. There's advantage for males because they can go to more food-rich areas and get kind of tanked up and beefed up for the breeding time period when they come back and set up territories. I'm going to show you a map, a different map of the California coast. This shows the, the range distribution in California, you know, approaching Half Moon Bay. And now you see it's coming right here, all the way up to Santa Barbara. These colors here, just to explain, when you get more blue, that means there's more, according to this, growth rate. But it's not really the growth as far as pups being born. It's the fact that it's a change over the previous year. And these animals that are exploring right now are primarily males, and they're coming down. They'll be here in another month or so, we think. They've been doing it for the last three years. They could change. See, others have fooled us before. Uh, but they seem to be coming down now in relatively large numbers. And they're entering into areas where there's oil. Not oil that came from ships or anything, but natural oil. This is actually a picture taken from Coal Oil Point. And ironically, these otters are hanging out right at the, the largest oil seeps uh, on the coast, and actually the second largest in the world. Um, it's a very interesting area from that respect. I won't get into oil seep. And uh, there's, a there's a site called Bubbleology, if you want to know about oil seeps. It's a really great site. Um, but uh, otters are hanging out right next to this oil. Now, if they're so acutely affected by oil, what's going on? And this is where I've got my head scratching. And how are they interacting with that oil without becoming um, killed by it? Now, it doesn't mean they're still healthy by being around there, but there's still a lot for us to figure out what they're doing down there and why they're hanging out there. Um, and if you've gone up to Santa Barbara, you've gone to the UCSB area, and you're off Coil Point, you can smell the fumes. And I don't know. I want to hang out there. But they, that's, where they, that's where they're coming right now. Okay, so where can you see sea otters right now? Well, I already mentioned San Nicolas Island has a group of about 40, but it's really hard to get to San Nicolas Island. Sign up for the Navy, you might get there, but you might not. And even if you were there, it may be hard to see these sea otters because they're pretty far offshore, and there's still just a few of them there. Off of Halama Beach, which is the only real uh, easy access to the coast where the county beach is, uh, if you know what you're looking for, you can look in the kelp beds off there, and they're fairly consistent there, and there are also females with pups up there. Um, but they're, they're not as easy to see as Monterey. I would still recommend, if you really want to see otters, go up to Monterey, have a great dinner, and watch them right there. Uh, under. 
But there, you can see sea otters there if you're in this area. Point Conception, the Coho Anchorage area, is where one of our most or larger rafts are. Again, private property, unless you live on Hollister Ranch, it's a little hard to see most of those animals. There's only a few people living at Hollister Ranch. But <clears throat> they're moving, and they're moving along the coast. And last year, the people that were doing the gray whale watch um, from, uh, uh, from the Coho Point area were uh, entertained by sea otters virtually the entire time they were there. They're very easy to see there. So that's a place, if you want to see them in Southern California, probably starting in December, they may be there. And then they may not be. Who knows? We'll see if they stick around. But they are definitely moving south. And this is the no otter zone. They're still illegal. <laughs> but for the time being, Fish and Wildlife Service has postponed any captures of otters pending a full evaluation of the program, which started in 2000. So it'll take a while to finish that evaluation. <laughs> okay, so uh, how do you see sea otters? You can look at them with binoculars, but the folks use uh, that are tracking otters, this is my daughter, she's an expert tracker already. Um, uh, we use high-powered telescopes. And if you were to look through one of these scopes, you might see something like this if you were up in the Central Coast. Now this kelp up here is more common in the Central Coast, and it's particularly abundant this year. It's really hard to count sea otters. But can you see all the sea otters in that picture? <laughs> this is actually on the USGS website. USGS, U.S. Geological Survey, another Department of Interior agency, actually has a lead on research in sea otters, by the way. You probably didn't know that. Um, and then uh, they put this on their website, and this is where the otters are. Okay. So you have four otters in this picture. And I'm going to go back to it so that you can um, see it again. Now it's really easy to see them again, right? Okay, we have one right here. You can see its head. You can see another head right over here, another head right here, and another one right here. That's with a high-powered telescope. Uh, in all truth, though, it's a little, this is a little unfair because you're just seeing this still image. If you're sitting there on the, on the uh, bluff, you would sit and wait and see if one of the animals moved. <laughs> and, uh, and you could spend a little time uh, on that. But they, they, that's how you would find them. Now, you may uh, not be so lucky to see one alive. You may be unfortunate or fortunate, whichever way you look at it, find one dead. And I want to point out a few key features because we're going to see animals as they come down the coast. Animals die of various reasons. And people walk down the beach, and we have a lot of people on the beach, and so they've come across dead. How many people come across a dead sea lion? I mean, just out here, Park Service probably gets a um, couple a month or more that someone comes in and says, there's a sea lion down there. Can you do something about it? Well, anyway, if you find a sea otter, um, here's some things to look for. First of all, they're bigger than you think. You can kind of get a size of this animal. It's a relatively large animal here. Um, they're about the size of a laboratory retriever dog, um, if you were to cut off the legs. Um, and um, they have teeth, although teeth aren't a really good indicator of, of for sure, because there's good teeth in sea lions. Uh, you can see there's a little ear patch on the side here. I want to point out the teeth, though. If you found an animal that was sick on the beach or alive, um, it would be best not to try and pick it up. It would be best to call someone to, to deal with that because even though they look cute and cuddly, they could bite you. I've only been bitten once. And I was separating mom from a pup, so it was okay. She, she deserved to give me a good bite. But um, anyway, you have to be careful of the teeth. But um, looking also closer, if you look at the rear flippers, okay, these aren't too different from a harbor seal, but if you look at the four flippers, it's a little hard to see, but they're like cats. So if you see the four flippers look like a cat paw, it's a sea otter. And then the last one, and I always ask this for someone that's calling one in, because we've had people call in things ranging from a muskrat being a sea otter or a, um, uh, what were some of the other interesting ones? Uh, well, the most interesting one, somebody reported one, and, and we're pretty sure this is what they thought it was. It was a cow. Um, <laughs> but... I, uh, I asked uh, I ask him, did you see a tail? This is the key indicator to distinguish between this and a uh, pinniped, a seal or a sea lion. You won't see a tail on a seal or a sea lion. Uh, you might see a tail on a possum or something like that, and they still get confused. Or a <laughs> cow. Yeah. Yeah. We have. So I'm wrapping it up. Um, there's a lot of research going on. This is a picture of me with a pup up in Bering Island in Russia. Most of the work is now focused on comparing different populations 
because we're comparing what animals are doing in Russia to what's going on in southeast, uh, southwest Alaska, to animals going on uh, in regular, part, uh, regular parts of Alaska, the middle parts of Alaska, as well as in California. Um, and we're finding a lot of neat things, um, including bad teeth and so on. Uh, this is a young Russian boy becoming a veterinarian uh, for the first time in Russia. And that's all I had uh, to, to go for that. I went a little bit over what I had.